Hello and welcome to Unsupervised Thinking, a podcast on neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and science more broadly. We are a group of computational neuroscientists. I'm Grace. I'm Connor. And I'm Josh. And the topic for this episode is the ethical issues that arise if we have artificial intelligence. So this is um, a rather broad topic because artificial intelligence can be very broadly defined. Um, So we're going to try to give some kind of overview of a lot of different things either that or we'll end up having an in-depth discussion on the first topic that interests us. Hmm. But uh, so you can kind of break this up into two groups. One uh, category of ethical discussions around AI is kind of just what are the effects of using artificial intelligence in society and the impact and are there ethical issues that come up when we think about that? And then there's another kind of more far off uh, issue to deal with, which would be like, what is the moral status of artificial intelligence? If these things are as complicated and intelligent as humans, do we have to treat them in, as humans and give them rights and that kind of thing? So we'll probably and focus presumably more... there's many other issues that we won't talk about as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we'll probably focus more on, on the former topic and a little bit on the latter one. Um, and it's kind of a, an interesting time to talk about these things because uh, artificial intelligence is kind of fashionable and taking off, and so there's been a lot of initiatives to address these issues. So, for example, there is um, the there's a, a something that was started out of Carnegie Mellon, the KNL Gates Endowment for Ethics and Computational Technologies. Uh, there's another one out of MIT and a think tank in Boston called the Ethics and Governance of Artificial Intelligence Fund. And then there was a partnership on AI that's between a lot of the major companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft. And it's trying to kind of get people together to have standardized ways of dealing with AI and thinking about AI. And in addition to that, there's a lot of individuals at universities that are thinking about these topics and companies have kind of in-house ethic boards and that kind of thing. So it's a it's a topic that people are addressing, maybe more so than, than past scientific topics that have raised ethical concerns. People are kind of trying to get out in front of this one uh, these days. Is that true? I think maybe part of the getting out in front of it is seems to be people have very extreme expectations or anticipations of what might happen. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, there there is like people people are acting as though we're just kind of barreling forward in this technology without anyone thinking about the consequences. But I don't know. When I look at it, I feel like maybe as a result of that critique, there are a lot of people who are kind of officially set up to think about the consequences. Yeah, partly because there's this sense that it's a really big deal and and could change everything. Although, I mean, I don't know that the the topics that these kind of think tanky places are focusing on are actually going to be the most relevant problem is it's hard to predict what will happen as a result of a new technology, but there's at least people trying, it seems like. So we can start with what is already happening, types of what you could call AI that are already being used and the impacts that they're having. So, I mean, there is a tendency to, you know, once we have a technology, we stop calling that artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence is always like something that will come in the future, and it refers to a more difficult problem than we've already solved. Like happiness. (laughs) Artificial (laughs) happiness, or? (laughs) Or no, just that happiness is elusive. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Whatever you have isn't happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get there someday, guys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, so we read, one of the things we read is this, uh, The Ethic of Artificial Intelligence. It's from the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which was previously called the Singularity Institute, but I think they wanted to be more credible, so they changed their name recently. <laughs> um, but so they have this report about various ethical issues, and um, some of the things that come up are basically algorithms that 
could be used today or and, and possibly are in, in some companies used today to kind of make decisions about, you know, if you apply for a mortgage or um, one of the big things that was in the news um, from a ProPublica piece was recidivism rates and predicting, like, should we let this person out of jail or how likely are they to, to commit a crime again? And the idea is that there's these kind of black box algorithms that a company has made, and because it's a company, it's private, and they don't have to share exactly how these things work, and it's just like, give us some information and we'll give you a prediction, and we're not going to tell you how. And there's a worry that uh, these algorithms might show some kind of bias or not actually be reflecting the way that we would want uh, they're not they're not doing what a human would do in that situation. It's not actually automating what a human would do. It's kind of doing something slightly different and taking into account weird factors that we don't want it to use in order to make those kinds of decisions. Or even if it's doing what a human might do, we don't necessarily want to allow you know prejudices to get in the way. If it's rational, if it's optimal from an accuracy standpoint to use certain superficial features or... Uh, like, for example, history of some sort, we might want to avoid using those factors because we know them to be discriminatory. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, this this topic comes up, and there have been uh, apparently papers written on this, that there are trade-offs between the accuracy of certain algorithms and how discriminatory they are in effect, even if something, it, some algorithm might show higher performance, we might opt against it if we know it to be discriminatory. And this is, I think, implicitly very present in human decision making, for example, when it comes to uh, the way people are screened at airports or things like this, right? I mean, an effort is made made uh, to screen people more randomly rather than using uh, like preferential screening of certain ethnic minorities. The claim, right? Well, okay. It is claimed that an effort is made to, be more uh, to do that. And the reason for that is because of the social effects of that discrimination, even hypothetically, or if empirically, it were the case that being discriminatory in in who were screened were more effective. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is a choice that I think we have to keep in mind and our values end up playing into this regardless of the decision maker. But in AI settings, there's like the fact that the decision maker has been programmed in some cases, people seem to just ignore the fact that that might encode people's biases or encode biases. So, so what's effective as a as a classifier uh, might not be something that we decide is ethical, especially if we know the classifier is using features which like are discriminatory. Yeah. So there's a few there's a few issues in there. There's kind of like the implicit sense that an algorithm will be programmed to merely be accurate as accurate as possible and not consider what factors it's using to reach that accuracy. And we may say, I don't care how accurate you can get by using, you know, race or something like that. I don't I don't want that as part of the decision making process. And then on top of it, there's the fact that what counts as accuracy, if we're feeding in kind of past data that was made by humans, what we consider accuracy might actually be a little distorted. So in the recidivism rate example, it's possible that you know, so in the actual example in the ProPublica article, the algorithm does not have access to the race of the person who is being evaluated, but it does have access to things that correlate highly with race. Um, I think like address or income or like a whole set of factors that you could guess someone's race from. Um, and so therefore it could potentially be using something that's correlated with race to, to make a decision. And it may be the case that it'll be uh, better at predicting who will recommit crimes because there's a bias in policing. And so a black person will be more likely to be picked up for a crime. And so that'll be like, oh, look, the algorithm was right. That person re-offended. When, you know, it, the, the algorithm's accuracy is actually determined by potentially a human bias. So there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of like a confirmation bias built into yeah. this loop where, like, people who have committed crimes in the past are more likely to be, you know, correctly classified because the people who committed crimes and were never caught in the first place or committed crimes and, uh, you know, you know, it was their first crime, but they were never, you know, kind of predicted to be as such because people of that demographic aren't as frequently, you know, caught, for example, with like drug crimes, like marijuana use, for example, that might be a case where that's kind of obvious. Um, 
Yeah, so I think the the issues that are being raised by people like Kathy O'Neill, who has written a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, which talks about these kinds of algorithms that are, are being used in a variety of settings, uh, the issues that they're pointing to is this idea that we're claiming that because we're using algorithms, it's removing human bias. But if those algorithms are trained on data that has human bias baked into it, then they're just going to learn to replicate that human bias. Or alternatively, uh, we may just decide that we value enough kind of not profiling people that we're willing to sacrifice accuracy in the algorithm. And these algorithms are only designed to, to reach a high level of accuracy. And so they're going to be kind of putting forth a, a behavioral pattern that we don't agree with in terms of our like ethical standards. There was that interesting example of, um, was it Facebook or something? There was some revelation from somebody who was working their revelation in quotes, depending on how much of a revelation you think it is. Um, someone who was working there had some task where they had to kind of, in some way, label, I think, items of news or something like flag them in some way. I can't remember what it was, like appropriate or inappropriate or, you know, some type of, they're putting labels on some on kind of news. Um, and that was then being used as, you know, training data, presumably for some algorithm that requires labeled examples to do its learning. Maybe we can explain what that means or something. Um, and this person was basically making the claim that like, there were kind of like very obvious biases that were even in some cases kind of, you know, is this the, the, like, they were kind of downrating conservative news stories, news yeah. stories that favored conservative viewpoints? That was probably it. Because there was probably, they probably hired, like, a bunch of young people from New York or yeah. something to, to rate these news stories. And, and then I think someone was advice. talking about, like, you know, this almost being, like, encouraged then by the culture inside, you know, if you have a bunch of liberal people together or something. So it's just, like, effects were kind of, you know, things can end up looking algorithmic and it's another example of where something like has a root in a sort of complicated social dynamic that we know can give rise to all kinds of you know biases and so on um that then gets is kind of the seed of some algorithm that then gets stamped as like unbiased because it's a computer or yeah whatever. it's this idea that computers couldn't possibly be biased but in reality these algorithms are trained on data from someone you know there's been some data collection and that data could contain a bias what we really need is like little random micro drones that will go around and collect unbiased data randomly <laughs> from all of us all of the time and then feed those into algorithms. Then and we can do perfect social control and social engineering. It's that will potentially be totally possible for certain types of data sets, but <laughs> I'm not so hopeful. You know, but this board. kind of relates to, so there's kind of, at least there's a super superficial connection between like this idea that algorithms can be biased in a sense like we need diversity in tech so that like this doesn't happen, which I think is a little bit naive because it's not the programmers who are, I mean, in the Facebook case, if it's people who work for Facebook who were creating the data set, then it is their bias. But most of the time, you're kind of taking a data set from some other situation and using it to train your algorithm. And the, the programmer in that is not putting their own bias in. They're they're putting in the bias of the data, and the data could come from anyone. So, I mean, it won't hurt to have diversity in tech, but I don't think to, to, to assume that that's going to be the solution, I, I think is... I mean, the, the benefit could be that those people might be more inclined check. to sort of yeah, consider. gut check things. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. yeah. But also, like, there's only so many data sets in the world, and it's like, it's not guaranteed that just because you're conscious of it, you can find a data set that doesn't have bias. So uh, one of the arguments that um, Kathy O'Neill and others make is this sense that to prevent against this kind of thing, these algorithms need to be more uh, interpretable. Uh, as it stands, you know, you can make an algorithm that can predict something where you really have no idea what factors it's it's using to make that prediction. You can feed it a whole bunch of information and it'll spit out like a yes or no, and you don't know what in that information made it make that decision. And perhaps as like a criteria for... And people call this black box. Right? It's just a black box. You don't know how it works. You can't see into it. Um, and so potentially like a, a criterion for for whether we can use an algorithm for important decision making is whether or not we can understand how it's functioning. So, but it is it is an interesting thing because like sort of in the history of statistics, it's sort of been the case over time, I mean, very, very superficially that algorithms have tended in the direction of becoming more black boxy because 
people maybe start with simple algorithms that they understand how they work. And then you have like some problem, like some task where there's like some clear metric of success. Like how many of these labels that we have, did you predict correctly or something like this? And then people sort of build black, black box algorithms, uh, which uh, maybe are easier to, to build than not, 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 I mean, easier is complicated, but like, I mean, there's a larger space if you if you include yeah, exactly. black box and not black box. That's a larger space than uh, not yeah. Black but box. so it maybe it requires a li- a little less sort of specialized training in a certain sense to build black box algorithms than it does to to go ahead. like some of the older machine learning stuff for like language processing might have required lots of input from like linguists or something. Linguists, whereas exactly. nowadays it can just be a bunch you of could be a total per- you could be totally not aware of any kind of you know linguistic uh expertise and still build something that can understand language using black box algorithms and so in some sense it requires like let's say it's not that it's easier it requires less expert knowledge or less domain knowledge um because you're not building it in such a way that it's expected to be interpretable it's kind of like a multi-purpose thing you can apply it to anything yeah like the same algorithm could be applied to multiple different problems with limited changes or something like that maybe um and if that's the case, it's it's almost that people have strayed from being strict about interpretability because it's been kind of useful or or valuable to go in the black box direction. Yeah, this is kind of um, like an accuracy interpretability trade off that you might have to make. Yeah. Why can't we just instead of demanding interpretability, like let's suppose demanding interpretability actually is hurts our ability to do certain things too much or something in a way that we can't get around. You could demand, in the same way, I guess, that we do of human systems that are complicated, that they kind of are able to pass certain tests of ethics, ethical tests, kind of. Right? If you have some complicated policing system, there can be social dynamics. Okay, there can be, like, let's just say there are explicitly racist police, but let's say there aren't. Like, let's say we're in some area where there aren't, there aren't like, it's not that every police person is explicitly racist. There can, it can still arise through, like, social dynamics I didn't have to pick that particular example, but it can still arise through social dynamics that effectively outcomes are racist or are whatever ist. There can be prejudices that get that kind of emerge um, and aren't easily pinnable to you know some like a certain individual, a fault certain individual who like, is yeah. like the evil guy. Yeah, these things kind of appear in. in uh, yeah, in I'm, not, I'm not asserting that that's the general case, but it's just it is certainly possible. Like, mm-hmm. and we we know this is possible. Um, and you know, people talk about things like implicit biases in various ways that, like, you don't even know that you have. Say, mm-hmm. and in those situations, what we do is, I mean, okay, a lot, many people would say we we fail in many of those situations, but at least in theory, what you can do is examine the outcomes and you know assess them according to some criterion that is kind of independent, some ethical criteria that you have in mind. Um, I feel like this is inevitably how you, how you have to approach. This, this kind of algorithmic I mean, that, question. In some sense, too. that's almost a more pragmatic approach, right? Instead of saying, like, we want to go for scientific purity when it comes to understanding what's going on, we'll, 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 we'll take the thing that does better effectively and then we'll, you know, strap on extra constraints. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this comes up um, in one of the articles, um, this idea that predictability is important that you don't want to be kind of surprised by the outcome of the model. And so if you've tested it and kind of have a sense of what it generally does, then you can just apply it to new things and kind of trust it in a way that it's not going to to deviate from from what you've tested it to do. And um, Kathy O'Neill started a company to do this kind of um, evaluation of algorithms. It's like a consulting company that audits algorithms to test them for these kinds of biases. I think in a way where, so as uh, as we've talked about, part of the problem is that these are owned by companies, and so you don't get to know how they work. There's a, a kind of a, a, a basic question that even the people who program them can't fully understand how they work, but then there's also an additional problem where the company won't share with you any information about it, and so you really can't know how it works from the outside. But you can still run these tests on it to see if I give it this input, what is the output, and try to get a, a sense of how it behaves. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like all generally like any kind of system or technology that has potentially kind of wide social consequences in the end 
we're going to want there to be some some type of regulation and or like democratic kind of input into what these thing what these things do just like the values that they ex- express just like anything basically yeah, but I feel that's like, a hard problem always I feel I feel like it's not clear that we've always held humans to these things like yeah. I didn't really think about the decisions that are going into who gets a mortgage or credit card or rates or whatever like totally. it was just like something like well yeah there's a system set up to do that but now that it's being made explicit with an algorithm there's an opportunity to think more critically about what that decision making process is so in some sense, this, yeah, I mean, as you're suggesting, and I, I think I agree, this, because, I mean, this, to, to me, this has always been one of the selling points of, like, let's say, rigorously quantitative thinking about any problem, is that you, you essentially must explicitly state in, like, formal language what you're doing. And it forces you to, to for anything that you're thinking about, essentially write down what you know as clearly and formally as possible and you'll find that there are holes in what you're thinking about. It, 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 it doesn't, but it doesn't just force consistency. By like laying it out, it, it opens it up to more explicit criticism. Yep. Um, so you might like think you have a great idea, but if you can't write it down in very rigorous language, that great idea probably is not sufficiently well resolved yeah. to really... The thing that I think is ahead. interesting, though, is that I imagine that... Like, I agree with what you're saying, but I imagine that there are areas where things are already quite explicit but have terrible consequences anyway and mm-hmm. that people could understand them, but the real barrier to them being kind of reined in and preventing their social harm is our kind of political barriers. So, like, for example, finance. Probably the laws around what you can, what kind of financial instruments you can and cannot make like, are there to be read and, like, that system is there to be understood. It's, like, probably... I mean, okay, you could argue that actually, no, in fact, it's all backroom dealing. But I think, I like, think there's, is. there is an understanding that, like, a lot of these things just don't make sense that they even exist, you know? Sure, sure, sure. And that's kind of, like, somewhat common knowledge. Obviously, there are people who defend the opposite view. But, like, you know, my point is that there are people who think that that's very clear, like many people who think that that's very clear and think this is a big problem that needs to be attacked. And the reason it's a difficult problem to attack, despite that clarity, is for, like, for social, social reasons. reasons right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think actually, it my my leaning, uh, sort of, uh, in terms of policy, is that I think it's actually not as clear as people who think that it's very clear think it is, um, which is to say that there are, I, from a purely economic standpoint, I'm not talking about, like I think there are there are clear benefits for, let's say everyone economically for there to be, f- like some sort yeah, of finance yeah, but that's like and I, I'm statement. not an expert on this I don't know no I don't know what parts are, are good and bad and I think most of the people who criticize it like a- among the lay public don't know what sub features of of the finance system are good and I bad think, I think I don't think I think it's pretty clear like I mean for example like and I think I, I'd even, I, maybe I'm even skeptical that like the experts really know I mean I think there are regulations that many like economists would agree on that we should have and we probably don't have and i'm I, like again this is but these are very complicated mathematical objects exactly but that's so clear it's like why do we yeah. want like give me a good reason why we need to have a derivative on of a derivative of a derivative of some complicated because combination of mortgages people, and or bets that someone isn't going to credit default somewhere if that bank. person's derivative doesn't like why do we need that object? Oh, it's so you can scrape the cream off, like, obviously. It's because the like nerds so, at the bank got bored. The nerds at the bank got bored. The nerds <laughs> at the bank weren't rich enough, or whatever. Or okay, like this is okay, sorry. deviating this is a bit of a deviation. far from So the artificial intelligence. <laughs> I was trying to draw an analogy, okay? And you guys wouldn't just let me have it. So. Yeah, no, banks are bad. <laughs> that wasn't my point. That was not my point. Oh, God. I sound like, it made me sound like a hack. I was trying to draw a clear analogy that made sense. Ah, yeah. So, um, what was that, the first topic? That was the first topic. All right. Um, So, uh, then the next topic, which is getting a lot of attention, is self-driving cars and questions that arise from having to kind of explicitly lay down what we would want cars to do in difficult situations. So, something... So, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, again, I mean, like, you could think about it as... Is this a technological problem? But I, I guess, you know, here we're kind of focusing on the values question, which is like, what do we do in certain hairy situations around the boundaries of 
using this technology, assuming that it can be done, because it seems like it'll it'll happen. Yeah, I mean, right? so the the first kind of group of things that we talked about are things that are, if not already happening, very close to to be happening. Like there's companies devoted to those kinds of things, and and there's companies that are making yeah. self driving cars. So this is clearly something that's coming up and will be a problem and something to think about because these things are being made and they're making some kind of decision and perhaps it would be better to be kind of more explicit and forceful about the type of decisions that we want them to make. Exactly. And I think it's worth keeping it framed in the context of decisions, right? It's not that we don't have certain knowledge or certain, like, this isn't a question of what we can do. It's a question of what we should do, assuming we can do it arbitrarily well. So like, assuming we can make certain decisions with driving, but like, yeah. accepting I mean, that there will be certain failure rates, or assuming we can make decisions about lending, or, you know, uh, or, you know, predictions. It's a little bit of both, though. I mean, it's like, given what the technology can do, how should it act? Because you're still taking into account some limitations. Like, in the questions that come up with self-driving cars, it's a lot of like, well, if you're faced with this situation where you're going to hit person A or person B, what should you do? And that's assuming that the car couldn't uh, accomplish hitting yeah, no one. So, I, so there's limitations still. That reflects like a, like, let's say a deep philosophical truth almost. And any deep philosophical truth is kind of a tautology. Uh, <laughs> Jesus just which is dismissing the field of philosophy entirely. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's, it's it's worth like math is also tautologies. We, well, math it's is interesting tautologies, but it's it's worth pointing out interesting tautologies, and and I think maybe one of those is that like in the real world, it we 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 cannot assume omnipotence or omniscience of these algorithms or or systems. There will always be trade offs. Like that's just that is that yes. is like a fact. Yeah. Is that there will be trade offs. And so the question is, which trade-offs interest us, right? How do our values help us decide what the outcomes or, or what the relative balance should be when we're confronted with trade-offs? Between, like we, if we have an optimal system, there will still be trade-offs. Mm-hmm. So a self-driving car that, does, that drives as well as is physically possible will be confronted with trade-offs. Yes. And what do we want to do with that? And there's so there's an interesting. I mean, that's just one question, right? Like, right, yeah. But, but I feel like that's the the background. That's how values like get injected. Yeah, but into this, this is like discussion. a certain bias that you have in your way of thinking about the world. I think it's okay. like a, it's like an aesthetic tendency, right? I mean, because there can be so many. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but like there can be so many problems that arise that are much more to do with like what imperfections actually exist. You know, so that, that, that what is, are the actual mechanics of how, yeah. Yeah, so that is, that is like one issue, which would be what imperfections exist in terms of the algorithms that are going to be used for lending or driving. And that, that, that I think is an interesting question, but I feel like these questions that we're discussing seem to center around how to balance trade-offs. And I think it's worth pointing out and it's, it's, it's maybe worth the reason it's worth emphasizing this is because as these things do get better, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's almost a cop out to only say that it's because the things are imperfect that they're discriminatory. And what I'm saying is even when they're perfect, yeah, yeah. whatever that means, yeah. they will still be to some extent discriminatory and mm. how we balance that is interesting. And yeah, it, yeah. there will be, ne- there will never be a car, not just because it's like, not because we're incompetent, that, that drives perfectly, but yeah. because the real world There's is full no of tra- such things. Physics, yeah, physics, yeah, physics is such that yeah. there will no, yeah. there will, there will never be a system that drives perfectly. So, given that, assuming we engineer things as well as possible, so ignoring the engineering error, which is kind of boring in some sense. Mm-hmm. What are like what is what are we training it to do? It's never exactly, going to do it yeah. perfectly, but what are we training it? The to objectives do? Which is- that we inject into the system are where the biases are going to come from. On mm-hmm. top of what, whatever we can't avoid, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so where those we are put those our are preferences and our values. It, exactly, those, that's where we put our preferences, right? So like, I think these, I view these as like two things that kind of interact, like um, in the sense that I mean, like some naive description of this would be that like the kind of clean scenario where you assume that you have maybe like perfected the thing or something can tell you a lot about where you could even be going. 
and that that's should, like a like, bound form a lot about yeah and that should inform a lot of what you're kind of like if it turns out that you know like if it turns out that using some technology will inevitably have these and these negative consequences or something then that like tells you a lot about where you're going or if you know that it can on, some technology can only be this good then you know that you kind of yeah it's a bound as you say it constrains like how you think about it um but then i don't know i don't think it's right to say that the engineering problems are are like uninteresting and it also I mean, feels like they kind of those are interesting of, in like scientifically yeah. in engineering yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. not they're very yeah. interesting problems but i, I don't yeah. know if i feel like a little too much blame or focus when it comes to conversations of the consequences of things arise from the uh criticism of like the engineering or something like yeah. oh it's the engineer's fault that this algorithm has a discriminatory consequence sure. I, and like in some sense it is but it's 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 the task the engineer was was tasked with rather than maybe their shortcoming as an engineer and and that's what i'm trying to like emphasize i guess right it's like if you produce an algorithm that's discriminatory that might not have been a failing as an engineer that might have been excelling at a narrow task yeah and so in some sense it was the task that you were assigned or that you took upon yourself to solve of your own initiative was a poorly conceived of task and you might have done it very well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so like, I mean, you could say like, oh, well, that means you didn't do it very well because like you couldn't have done a bad task in a good way. But like, of course, you can excel at doing something terrible. <laughs> and so I, th- I think it's worth, it, it's, it's worth distinguishing between whether there's a shortcoming and that's what gave rise to the mistake that people effectively see at the product level or something like this, mm-hmm. or whether the, the, the mistakes arise from the values imposed in the task definition uh, or problem definition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to make this more concretely about the self-driving car issue. So according to some article somewhere, um, maybe Wired, there are 30,000 car accident deaths each year and over a million injuries, and the vast majority of them, like 95%, are due to what's called human error of some form, um, and 40% of them are explicitly about drunk or distracted driving. And so that kind of puts the bar, like, yes, a self-driving car will not be perfect, there will be accidents, but if it's performing better than this, then we should go ahead with the whole self-driving car initiative and perhaps make them mandatory and not let humans drive because there is empirical evidence that outcomes measured in terms of deaths and injuries are are better than they would be if we let humans do it so that gives you a clear comparison it's not asking for anyone to be perfect but at least better than the current system okay so the the criticism that i'll inject which i feel like comes up a lot when people just look at the statistics are like that's not consistent with people's gut and it's not consistent for a good reason which is there are many people who feel, right, that they're like particularly safe drivers. And so if you feel as an individual that you're a very safe driver, the fact that now this is out of your hands, yes, overall, maybe it will lower everyone's risk on average. But like maybe it will be negative with respect to your personal risk. Well, I mean, that's kind of suggesting that... um, Distracted and drunk driving only hurts the distracted hurts and the drunk person. person. Yeah, yeah, of course I it can hurt other people. I, I understand. would feel safer knowing that it's there aren't drunk drivers yeah. on the road. Yeah, yeah I, I get that, but I mean, I th- it, it, like I, I'm just trying to bring this up because like the sort of first pass, like I would I would call naive analysis is like, yeah, okay, everyone's going to benefit because so you're claiming the risk that there's go some down. distribution to the damage that relates to the people causing the damage. And I'm not saying it's the right decision to like say, no, no, I should get to keep driving because I'm particularly safe. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, people could be wrong about that, and it might turn out that statistically everyone is in fact safer. But it, I'm, I'm just saying like the reason why people's gut might not align with that statistic, I think, is because people have differences in, in lots of things where they feel like, no, no, like I'm not as at risk as many people are for whatever reason. Uh-huh. Um, and this change while I understand that it will be beneficial for most people on average, maybe won't be beneficial for me. And again, I'm not saying that that's the right attitude to take, but I, 
I feel like that that is something that's consistent with the way a lot of people might feel, at least. Sure. And why that statistic might sound slightly irksome to them if they if they just heard the statistic and heard that like, oh no, we're doing self driving cars and no one's gonna be allowed to drive anymore because uh, because of this. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So the other question that comes up in this kind of thing is who is to blame if there is still an accident with two self-driving cars? Um, and I read that in Nevada, the law is that whoever like turns on the self-driver is considered the driver, and therefore they're at fault. Um, that seems and pretty, I think, uh, hmm? pretty, pretty friendly to business. <laughs> yeah. It's not who made the car. It's whoever turned on the self-driver. I mean, which in a way, I mean, in, in the current state of things makes sense because the, the self-driving technology isn't quite there yet. So if you're going to say, like, no, I'm going to let the car drive, like, I, you should be liable for that. Um, but I think they also said that in that situation, you wouldn't get in trouble for texting while the self-driving is happening, but you wouldn't be allowed to have the car self-drive while you're drunk. So <laughs> it gets very hairy. Is is the point? That's fucking least, useless. The whole point of self driving cars is to drink, drink and <laughs> we're going to work or, a nap. <laughs> or coming home from work. Yeah. Either way, whichever way. You work. <laughs> Depending on your job. Oh God, uh, I have some limp, bloody version of self driving cars where you have to like sit in a seat and look forward. Well, that's the like, transitional form. I mean, the uh, transition yeah. is going to be the hardest part. Is that's this fine, I guess, yeah. period where it's like you're you're supposed to still be vigilant in case something happens? Like that's when all the accidents. Are gonna I happen. want to be like sitting in a hot tub, you know, like with the roof down, like, <laughs> drinking a glass. Of I mean, I, I know maybe we want to get a little bit to basic income, but jumping the gun a little bit, it's almost as if there's a certain stage of capitalism before universal basic income, where you where it's the same thing as that self driver car situation. It's like robots can an AI or whatever can kind of do everything. But like people have to like go through the motions mm-hmm. of having having like it's like the worst possible world. Josh's like... extremely elitist view of work in <laughs> modern the modern world. No, I'm not. Geez. I'm not saying that's what work is right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm saying one can imagine that there will be an analogy to, like. That self-driving yeah, car like situation robots that is can close. make everything, but someone will have to stand there and watch, watch the stupid robot. Watch the robot. Yeah. Those people will be even stuff. more immiserated than yeah. they already are. Like, yeah. that, that's that's all I'm saying. But I'm I mean, worried. and I think in some automation settings, that is essentially the case, right? Is there's a person watching a robot, and they have like they have to stand there and like press a button when it like does something that's it's like uh, when normal, you use doesn't a, do very a self-checkout line in a grocery store, but the like, people still just there, keep yeah. staring at you. It's like, what's the point of this? That's <laughs> so weird. Um, no, but I'm worried that in this transitional form where it's like self-driving cars can work in most circumstances, but in the, the bad cases, you need to pay attention that people won't pay attention. There'll be a bunch of crashes and accidents that are attributed to self-driving not working. Like the transitional form is going to ruin the credibility of self-driving, even though the problem is that humans didn't respond when the car told them it was their turn. That's what I'm yeah, worried about. Yeah, but there is a sense in which it's like, well, maybe, you know, having the situation where humans are like sitting there inattentive and inactive yeah, no, for it's a, it's potentially a design, hours but like, and then like they have to take their command like suddenly or something yeah. they should that's have, not really plausible psychologically we should have like good labor practices for like you know if you <laughs> no seriously like if you have to sit at a machine right it's degrading so like what you should have like a pottery wheel or whatever like <laughs> in like your i'm serious car? no i didn't mean i wouldn't take the car oh, okay. now right, but yes okay <laughs> No, the self-driving car one is a bit more of an actual problem because yeah. you probably have to, like, look or something. But, like, mm-hmm. if it's a case where it's, like, every time the red light comes on, you, like, you pull the lever or whatever shit, mm-hmm. right, and it only comes on once a week, then, yeah, you should be given, like, something things else to do. Can do yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I, I could knit yeah. while paying attention. I mean, I guess you just could, but you're probably not yeah. allowed. Like, you're probably no. like, forced to, like, sit yeah, there no, and look at the machine. Is, there you know, is. That's, like, the weird... I mean, I was, I was listening to something on NPR, and it came up that in the military... Uh, you know, I mean, and this is sort of obvious to people who have been in the military, but you're expected to be extremely vigilant. For very uh, rare events. For very rare events. So you have to be kind of consistently vigilant. I mean, this this is like the stereotype of guard duty or something yeah. like this, which is essentially what all of these things are describing, right? Is that like, it's it's very difficult to sit somewhere for like six hours doing nothing where like the probability of an event is extremely low, like might happen once every few but months. But it's a or very like important that. event if it happens. But it's very important. And it just psychologically I don't think people are really well suited to that kind of guardianship. When I worked at McDonald's in the drive through, 
um, it would be boring because like cars only come so often. So I would read Time magazine in mm -hmm. between, but I would always get yelled at for doing it, even though it didn't impact my ability to respond when cars See, came. That shit is yeah. hella evil. This is this is the future. Okay, so um, if we're going to talk about ethical issues surrounding self-driving cars, we are mandated to mention the trolley problem, which is something that comes from moral psychology, which is this question of like, so it, it arose as a thought experiment without any sense that self-driving cars would be a thing. But the uh, idea is if there's like a trolley on a track and it's about to hit some person, oh, but thing. you can pull a lever so that instead it hits a different person, uh, would you do that? Or uh, to make it more complicated, like it's going towards uh, two people, you can pull a lever so that it changes tracks and goes towards one person. And the idea is you set up these kinds of different circumstances, like it's going towards an old person and you can make it go towards a young person <laughs> instead. <crazy. laughs> By having people answer this question, like what would they do, um, you can get at uh, implicitly which kind of things they value more morally. Like are they purely utilitarian in the sense that they would just always choose to kill the least number of people? Do they have some sense of like fate where they wouldn't want to change the direction of the trolley because like oh, it's yeah. not their you know, place, place in the universe. Yeah, like the trolley was destined to hit that one person. Um, so there's a there are people who are setting out to survey a lot of people with these kinds of problems to potentially get at a way to collect what humans believe about these things and use that to to train self driving cars. Maybe even though that again wasn't it's the, very the point. That's right? so weird and interesting. <laughs> no, but it, it it's weird, right? Because it's not clear. That what humans are currently doing is even the thing that yeah, we want to no, encode in yeah, the cars. So this is oh an interesting God. distinction. Like if, if if you if you polled people, for example, we're picking this example based on an example that came up earlier, right? If you polled people and it turned out that their preferences were like racist or sexist or some other in, <laughs> yeah. discriminatory and in some other like, way, oh, we need to make sure that our self-driving cars are appropriately racist to <laughs> accurately reflect. The <laughs> but this is the distinction in like that's not what we should do. In the first section that right? we talked so, about, it was the case that people were like, "We're going to use algorithms so that we don't have human bias." But a lot of the talk about how to deal with self-driving cars is like we need to accurately capture what humans want to happen. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's yeah. weird, right? It's it's not necessarily yeah. ideal, um, and. So if it turns out that people say, "Yeah, you should you should never take action, even if it kills a hundred uh, people, and you could have killed know. zero, you know, if their sense is something like yeah. that." Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like I understand the trade offs at, at play, but it it does seem like maybe we should program the cars to have responses that we evaluate to be better than the responses that humans might, you know. But like yeah, but it's this general thing, like who's doing the evaluating and the uh, what? What of is better yeah, than what humans yeah. would evaluate? I, there's no objective aliens. answer to. <laughs> what would the aliens find do? the super intelligent <laughs> aliens who are super moral? So like, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example with the trolley problem. Like, if the question is phrased differently and or ex people are exposed to it differently, you get different questions. And you could speculate, and I think that this is at least a plausible hypothesis that like, if you ask people, is it better for like a self-driving car to kill one person or two people, you, they would say, well, it should kill one person. But if you said, if you were at the wheel and you had to steer away from one person, like, you know, two people to hit one person, which so would you do? We the right answer yeah. because we, we, the technocratic elite, pick the right answer and then we just phrase the question appropriately. Such to that get we, the math. Yeah, you could, you could do it then. currently right. works. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is an actual version that's used in, in psychology literature that involves like to stop the trolley, you have to like push a fat guy onto the tracks. Like, would you do that? And that's, yeah, that's rather, a standard psychology. Rather right? than pull a lever, mm -hmm. because then it's more personal. So yeah, the, the way you phrase it does uh, impact people's choices in this way. But no. there still isn't, it's not clear, there isn't a right answer. I mean, you have to just kind of see what people want. There's also the question of, should the car always protect the people in the car at the expense of people outside the car? Or should there be kind of like... Mm, a uh, oil car or a car that's willing to sacrifice. And them. there's a sense, there's a, this idea that you would have kind of like a knob <laughs> in the car that you can turn and be like, sacrifice I want you to be mode. super loyal today and I want you to be like... <laughs> or like different brands of cars would have different levels oh, of, uh, of... Yeah. Elite. So that's the... That would be very uncomfortable, right? Like you could pay yeah, for yeah, a more yeah. loyal car. That's the dystopian oh future we have to look forward to. Wow. You, you buy like one of those like hundred thousand dollars sports cars, and it's extremely yeah. loyal. Yeah, like, but you uh, buy like a the sedan, issue, like you know, welfare Cadillac, cars, like, uh, yeah. bulldozer versus like a go kart that 
<laughs> like runs you off the road for no reason. <laughs> The um, ones that are used to like cull the masses, or the or, or if you could pay for a car that goes faster and makes other cars like part in your way, yeah. <laughs> like the red <right> speed. <laughs> oh god. Okay. <laughs> so those uh, are terrifying all options. possibilities are endless, <laughs> and there are no solutions to the actual problems. That's the conclusion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, next topic. <laughs> uh, it's just going to get worse. Uh, AI is going to take all of our jobs. Discuss. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So my answer to this is maybe AI will take all our jobs and then it'll just be the same because we'll have to do politics where we try to wrestle control from the people who control the AI. And that's similar to now. End of conversation. <laughs> What's your take? Um, Did you? Was that coherent? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I follow what you're... It's just a thing where it's like, yeah, maybe AI is going to take all our jobs, but that's like a good thing because that means we have magical technology that can do a bunch of shit that we now have to do ourselves. And in a good world, what would happen is like everything would become lovely, right? And in a bad world where too few people have control over the consequences of our AI, um, it won't be as lovely as it should be. And that's like... Yeah, this, I mean, I think... You know, I think the the slightly like more grounded way of talking about this entirely like speculative topic. Oh yeah, but it's totally might speculative. Be, I mean, no, it might be to say that like given that there's like a strong sense of property rights in the contemporary world. Oh yeah, but now you're doing the uh, thing that you were talking about. Or now we're doing this like oh in the immediate term details. Thing, no, no, right? no, no. I'm not saying like I'm just saying now like there's a strong sense of property rights, mm-hmm. and so. Whoever like owns stuff will have a lot of the say, the say. Yeah. and people there will always be trade offs, right? Like even in a world where there's like abundant resources, there will be people who decide that they want, for whatever frivolous and self indulgent reasons, to exercise enormous quantities of those resources for themselves. So there'll be the one guy who says, "I think I should have a spaceship in a Mars colony to myself." Or something Are like that. Are you making fun of Elon Musk? Or no, Trump. no, it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, that could, could have applied to a lot of people. Yeah. Or I want, yeah. I want like some super yacht. Or I want to like, you know, yeah. whatever, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And so, and that fucker like, owns the thing or whatever. If they, if they own a lot of robots or whatever, yeah. they can then just do that without consulting people. Um, and meanwhile, there's like everyone else who's like, yeah, I want to have like a house and maybe like a cleaning robot or something like that. And we could trivially distri- redistribute things, assuming we're in this world of relatively more abundance. But the guy can't have his Mars colony. Yeah, yeah the guy. It's like if we redistribute things, there's like mo- everyone will get like you know people to help them prepare food and watch their children and like give them you know you know clean their apartment or whatever like things that our standard like middle class wants today or whatever but uh we we, like there'll be a trade-off between the people who who own like own things for maybe historical reasons and want kind of extreme things that require like extraordinary amounts of resource uh and and like the sort of more mundane wants of regular people and you know the trade-off will be probably the same i mean i think this is kind of getting at connor's point is that how that the outcome of that kind of balance is struck will probably be very political and it's it's not clear that in some ways like fundamental things will change it'll just be yeah it doesn't seem every- fundamentally different to me basically to where we currently are which is like there are huge imbalances of wealth and people have different attitudes to that right some people think it's fine some people think it's not fine and then there's like struggles over that and there's like power that comes with having access to lots of resources which enters into that thing you know and it just seems broadly sort of analogous to me. I mean, there's a little... So, obviously, there's been multiple times in history where people have been concerned that technology means the end of jobs, like the Industrial Revolution. People were making strong claims about that at that time, but, you know, we came up with other stuff to do. And so there's a question of, like, is there actually an end point where we will not have jobs for people or will we always just come up with different types of jobs for people to do? Yeah, and I guess the discussion we just had was, like, a brief discussion of the case where yeah we assume that there will be this end state where we have so many robots and ai things that we could effectively do whatever the hell we want Ish. and there'll be no need for yeah. humans to do anything but with I mean, some bounds or something yeah. like where yeah i mean there's there's clearly always going to be limits because there's like limited amount of stuff that we can possibly access to make energy or whatever 
and the end of that conversation is always like a Dyson sphere. That you know, in in, in the, like among the sci-fi nerd love, people, love that. that like the end of that conversation. I just listened to a podcast which, about the Dyson sphere, and it is super ridiculous and stupid. It's but. super cool, though. It's cool, but so that's the end of that conversation. <laughs> okay, so so you cool. guys are you guys are sci-fi nerds because you're all excited about. So for for context, the Dyson I'm not sphere. Like excited right? about it in like an immediate way, but like <laughs> in its in its extreme manifestation is that like. All Josh of the like matter in his lips as he explains. <laughs> 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 Go on. All of the matter in the solar system gets uh, converted into like compute material and energy harvesting things, and then forms like a sphere around the sun, so that the energy is optimally harnessed from the sun and used to power all the computers and mm. stuff like so that. So we're just basically. like in this thing around the sun, taking its energy. We can be wherever directly. we want. Like we can have a nice little planet over here. That oh, we I all thought live the idea was that like you, it. like people are in the thing in, in that, that surrounds the sun. Yeah. I mean, in the super extreme form, there's like, well, we'd all be know, uploaded. The fantasy of like uploaded oh, into the right, compute so matter around so. the, yeah. yeah. But I also, I'm heard... hanging on to my corporal like existence. Not for very as long, long as possible. And, I swear to God. Well, that's about if people trying to start trying to upload me. Like, <laughs> I will take I will take up arms immediately. In, so in your mind, it's going to be a forceful thing. Like, oh, yeah. like, it's not like a privilege. No, thing. I imagine some doctor being like, you know, you're you're reaching your end. Okay, so the question is, what do we do if all the jobs are being done by robots? I think there is, uh, yeah. So I guess my first instinct is like, yeah, there's, I see the progress in AI. It's definitely going to replace a lot of what people currently do today, and I don't have the imagination to think of enough jobs that will come uh, once the ones that exist today are gone. But I do think there is something to the idea that people will come to value human interaction and kind of like, you know, this back to artisanal, handmade, crafty way of life where like Etsy kind of stuff, like I'm willing to pay more to know that it was made by a human or I'm willing to pay to talk to a, a human, well-treated yeah, human and to talk to a yeah. human instead of, you know, talking to a chatbot or something like that. So it could be that human interaction and human labor becomes more valuable when we have things that are made um, exclusively by robots, but if that's enough to sustain so, an economy, I, I would be surprised. Why is that not? Yeah, so the well, the other the, there's a there's a, another example that I think commonly comes up and came up in one of the articles that we read of like Mac Mac stores as kind yeah. of being this kind of following this kind of paradigm. You're paying for like a luxury good in the first place, but they also like have lots of like it, kind of an excess yeah, like two employees of per like there. laptop that's like in the, in the building <laughs> yeah. at a given time. Yeah. It gets carried in something like, kind of absurd right. cushion <laughs> who then stay there until it's sold. It's, it's ridiculous. I hate going to Mac stores. Why do you disvalue human interaction? I don't. And what, human that labor. is not human interaction. Those people, I believe, no, because that's the thing. It is fake, right? But yeah. like, not really when they're forced to carry the Mac on a cushion. Okay, so but you don't think that that's, that's a useful... That is a negative development. This serves as, I think, an example for something that I would, would like to put forth like as an alternative, which is a lot of the, this, this framing around like humans coming up with new jobs, is it, it's as if like humans ought to come up with new jobs because somehow we want to augment the productivity of like an already extremely productive system in this in this extreme where there's like robots and AI doing lots of work like it's not clear i mean not to say that maybe the, i mean there are like philosophical reasons why people might say like work is a good thing and fine but let's say hypothetically you accept these things for like human dignity yeah i mean but so let's let's say you accept that like maybe doing some amount of work is actually good for your like you know your your psychology your soul whatever what what i would the, the, the sort of caveat that I would say is why not imagine and, and spend time imagining non-exchangist spaces that can exist in this world where people's basic needs are provided for. So instead of saying, yeah, I'm going to start a shop that's going to sell human-made goods in this world where like everything is taken care of, why not imagine other ways of interacting socially with people other than yeah I mean, like yeah i think the, give like like it could be more like a burning man setting where like you make stuff then just give it away for free world where we can take care of all our basic needs with robots and we don't have the fucking creativity to come up with like interesting ways to spend our time then like I, I, the whole thing is not worth fighting for like frankly i, I agree i mean if, if people decide like that they want to be you know self-driving cars exist but they want to be like they want to get paid some nominal amount by 
the future version of Uber to like uh, sit in the car and chat with people because like for pay. No, that's ridiculous. Like in some extremely capitalist fashion. No, I mean I think it's clear that these kinds of arguments are based on the idea that like. There's a sense that we don't believe that the fundamental way that humans make a living is going to be able to change. So you're going to oh, have yeah. to have a job, and therefore, oh, yeah. what can the jobs be that people will still like, like that you could still be paid for? Yeah, but that, I mean that idea should be yeah, discarded I mean, immediately. Yes. So the idea would be that everyone yeah, I mean, so, gets a universal I, basic income, and nobody has to have a job, and we're all just like. I mean, in the clear like Wall-E. The, sort of, I mean, the movie Wall-E. I haven't seen that movie. You guys people gotta really see like it. it. I mean, this. I mean, it's actually a little bit upsetting because everyone's like super obese and just like lazy. On a, sure, a thing, sure. and yeah, but anyways, I'm pretty optimistic about it to be honest. I think like people are. I, oh, so like the third kind of discussion here, we, we can come back to this in a second, but just to, to lay it out, right? It's going to be like, what would we do at all? I think like currently, there's all this kind of, there's also this much more mundane thing about like in the nearish term, what will, how will jobs be affected? I kind of think that's basically an orthogonal thing. You know, just just want to say, like, there, there's that also that issue, like in the kind of near term. Yeah, there will be what like will happen some... as jobs are displaced. Like, what will actually happen yeah. to those particular people, like in their lifetimes, yeah. as their jobs are displaced, given the way the world currently is, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think that requires like a lot of political action. Yeah. yeah, kind of in the near future to make sure those people are well taken care of and can be it's... retrained, maybe. Well. It's, uh, this is language of, of retraining, I mean, while in some sense I agree with it, I think is, like, really unaware of the, like, n- limited plasticity of people. If you have a 55-year-old who gets displaced prematurely from a job that no longer exists, from a field that no longer exists for human employees, yep. like, how much retraining can you expect to provide that person? Yeah. And I'm not trying to be condescending. But just practical. Like, I, that would be yeah. true of any, like, no matter how creative or intelligent you are if you've been doing something for a very long time and that whole whole regime goes away and i I think that yeah i mean that requires i think compelling political activism in the in the near term yeah yeah so this is like i mean the driving cars is going to be is actually probably going to be one of the earliest examples of that right because it'll be like for example truck drivers cab drivers um, yeah, I mean, the, it's, not, I, it's not a super technical job, I guess. But I mean, the transportation know. industry I read is like a third of jobs, or some crazy ass number. Like it's one, like yeah. the biggest employment sector. And the thing is, in the states, you know, a number of like a lot of trucking jobs are unionized jobs. Like a lot of cab dry jobs are like reasonably well protected. It depends on the city that you're in and how well regulated the cab industry is there. So like, there's already Uber, and there's already, and there's soon going to be self-driving like trucks and all that kind of thing so i think that's going to be a really relevant one of the earliest like yeah, actually we'll concretely see. relevant examples and like how to deal with that is is um important uh, so but uh, i mean i think it, we, we all come from a certain perspective which is that like it would be unfortunate for those technological developments to be stifled because uh like you want to protect jobs but at the same time like, if we aren't, as a society, uh, cognizant of the fact that there will be people displaced and somehow take care of them in some way that's appropriate, like, that's also, a, like, a deeply distressing yeah. Yeah. outcome. I was um, teaching a group of high school students over the summer, and it was an artificial intelligence class, and I was telling them, you know, about the advances in artificial intelligence and talking about that this might impact jobs and that kind of thing. And so I asked them, like, so what's your solution? If if AI can do all the jobs that we have now, what should we do? And it was almost unanimous, like, well, we need to destroy the AI. We need to not let the AI uh, advance enough. And it's kind of like that just, so I, just shows, like, a, a limited, you know, thinking about the problem. There are potentially other solutions. What age were these kids? A high school, like 15 through 18. It's it's surprising. I mean, I wonder if that is partly America. Like, I mean, if if you ask that question in a country like along the Mediterranean yeah, or something like, like this, go to the beach. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. We should do these. We should do like surveys of like. And actually, if you spoke, to, I mean, this is an open question. But like the people who who identify their their personality with their job, like. I have been studying to be a lawyer for a long time, and now I'm a lawyer, and I have a job at a law firm. Those people view themselves as lawyers, and that's like so a core part of their identity. So you think they're most threatened by the idea that an AI could write a law document know. or take 
their position. I'm also uh, the same thing would be true of scientists. Like if you told scientists, like you're no longer needed. I think a lot of people in the U.S. are like very much. I think there's this pretty strong culture here of like. Work respe- is. Yeah, work is what is like respected and like you need to like, you know, you, you work, you, you work hard, like you put in your shift, like all that kind of thing. And on a practical level, without a lot of social safety net, you do need to have a job. And so it's scary course, to yeah, think yeah, that totally. there will be very few jobs in the future. And I think there could easily be really terrible scenarios where we don't have any of the any of the benefits of like the stuff. I, th- I think it's totally conceivable that there will be a fraction of the benefit to most people that there kind of should or could be mm-hmm. um, at every step of the way. Because you're saying the benefit will be isolated. I mean, it'll essentially be wealth inequality on steroids. Yeah, exactly. All right. Do we want to talk about the ethics of falling in love with an artificial intelligence? <laughs> it seems so like corny, like compared to all these like actually kind of important things, but. I, I would fall in love with an AI if they're convincing. The hell not. But like, yeah, I, I just don't view it as. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Well, okay. So the the um, this topic came up from a Guardian article by Eleanor Roberts Robertson, which is a review of the movie Her, one that came out, the Spike Jones movie, um, where there's like it's in the future and there's an operating system who kind of is like in like knows everything about this guy's life and gets kind of progressively smarter over the course of the movie and he's kind of in love with her and there's you know complications ensue. But so the the idea, it is yeah. a good movie, although <laughs> Eleanor Robertson does not think it's a good movie. She was very critical of it. It actually um, bugged me. That yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the idea is more along the lines of like, if like if we were to determine that this AI is kind of equivalent in moral value to a human, what do we think about the idea that he kind of owns this operating system and, you know, is this AI uh, free or is it imprisoned by this person who owns the operating system? Or how do we think about those Bad kind of things? slavery. So, so it's a, this is a very, very far future um, idea. Yeah. I don't know. I feel well, like I think it's more, to me, the hardier question is, like, how would we ever be able to determine if we think an AI has equivalent moral value to a human like we never even again it's about being explicit about what we all believe like how do we determine which humans and which animals and which whatever have moral value yeah it's true the animal thing is a good one because like i'm pretty on board with considering all humans to be morally equivalent at this point but like the animal thing is it's hard to explicitly say why animals wouldn't fall or at least certain animals wouldn't yeah, fall under that well, and there are and there are classical arguments by peter singer that people consider extremely callous when they're like not in philosophical mode yeah. uh but like philosophers just like yeah these are interesting arguments yeah. right which is that you know a person who has severe mental handicaps, who's like not even necessarily very self-aware, compare them with a very self-aware animal, like a chimpanzee. You know, his claim is like, if we're being purely like rational with like, you know, it's essentially a humanist prejudice that we care more about that particular human over some particular intelligent chimp. Yeah, um, but it's because, why is that? Why is that a prejudice? Like, I mean, you know, it's, it's just kind of like it's a prejudice if you think that the rational thing to do is to use whatever metrics he's using. Well, so he, like, his, yeah. his his metric was like, let's say, sentience and or the ability to feel pleasure. Yeah, and if you, it's if you kind of like you, stupid if you think like you can just well, say no, like that's, t- that's that actually turns out not to be the thing you that can we just care say. No, exactly, I think it isn't. Human yeah, is the most yeah, important yeah. thing. Yeah. He's he's following through what we like. So people might claim that the, that the that the backing is because people are sentient or something, and then he's like taking it to its logical conclusion of being like, oh, it turns out this can't be the. Whatever. Yeah, if you were using sentience or ability to feel pleasure as the criterion, a person in, for example, a, you know, a persistent vegetative state, you would want yeah. to sacrifice over a monkey, maybe, right? Um, yeah. According to that calculus, yeah. but in fact, we don't, right? We might, as a society, we might you know, kill animals to preserve the life, I mean, hypothetically, right, of someone in some sort of very persistent vegetative state or who has, like, very limited cognitive abilities. And the balance there, it would you would claim, is because this person is a human or for the people who are religious, like, that person has a soul and, it, and the animal doesn't have a soul, which mm-hmm. in secular terms is basically because they're a person, like, because they're yeah. a human, right? Yeah. Um, 
So ju- it's just about them being definitionally a human. Yeah. yeah. So this really is another circumstance where AI would force us to be explicit about what we value and why so that we can know how to either import that to AI or how to judge AI. Yeah, if we felt like it, if I mean, I think trivially, if we felt like they were human, we would we would treat them. But that's such there, a there low would be bar. People who would treat them like because in one of this article, in one of these articles, it was talking about like, you know, we we clearly have a sense of what has moral worth and doesn't. If we saw a rock, we could like pulverize it and use it for whatever we want, and we don't care. And like as I was reading that, I was like, oh my god, maybe we shouldn't pulverize. Oh rocks. my god, we pulverize too many rocks. <laughs> yeah. Like, I can be made to care about anything. Yes, and it depends <laughs> on how you phrase it. And, like, for, yeah. take, take for example, dolls or, like, stuffed oh, animals. Oh, yeah, of course. That's right? the whole point is that you're supposed if, to care if you, for them. If you allowed humans to, like, value their stuffed animals over other human lives, there are definitely people who would. <laughs> yes, yes. Right? And so that actually... we, would, we would say that that's, like, a mistake. Yeah. Right? In some sense, like, that, that's not the responsible way to balance that yeah. trade-off. But the Danish Council of Ethics apparently put out a report that expressed concern about people um, like falling in love or overvaluing chatbots, essentially, like things that are kind of to most people, obviously not like conscious beings, but just like bots that are meant to, to make you like them. And they have like a fear that that will take over people and that they'll start to value those things. Yeah, man, look at Japan. Yeah, <laughs> just look at Japan. <laughs> we all need to Wait, think you, Have you even ever been Japan. there? Come on, you're just, you're just gonna like... <laughs> no, these are stereotypes. You've, you've never set foot <laughs> no, on, in that on, country. I'm on stereotypes that I've heard on the internet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure, that's a great thing to do. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, just like to clarify. I don't know shit about Japan, actually. <laughs> just some, some, is it racism? Are they racist? Yeah, I think, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to call it that. It's just some casual racism. I know, but like on a serious note, like, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up. I'm not going to defend it. <laughs> on a serious um, note, whatever. There are places where people do stuff that seems weird to us. Like, that's always the case. Yeah, there's always cultural differences, which is why it's going to be hard to know how to program the AI. I yeah. guess the AI will have, there'll be different cultural there's AIs. Be, yeah, and, and then there's going to be different cultural attitudes to AI. And there's uh, going to be some people who are like, oh, but like, you know, you can't treat the AI that Maybe way, we man. should just like, get rid of all of it. Maybe those high school kids were right. Get Push it off the AI. cliff. Yeah. I don't think we want to have. Yeah, I don't think we need to have all this, like, humanoid crap. I think we should just avoid that whole regime. Just so that we don't get confused. But people are going to do it. You know that some... Oh, yeah. You know, assholes it's already happening. That, you know? It's just like, God. That's the problem with people. They yeah, always they do things people. that they can imagine. Like, if you can imagine something, <laughs> you're going to do it eventually. Or, like, someone's going to do it. That's a problem. So this has been a fruitful and depressing conversation about... There were some high notes, too. There were some high notes, there were some high notes, yeah. AI could be... Cause, like, super abundance and all that. Yeah. And we just need to handle it right. That's the moral of the story. We're so just... I mean, there's there's a little bit of a take-home. Against, frankly, in my opinion. <laughs> no, but there, there's a bit of a take-home, which is that I think that in addition to whatever actions people are engaging in, in this case, we should also be thinking about what political consequences there will be and, like promote some sort of social changes that will be consistent with redistributing abundance in a in a fair and, and sort of just fashion. Definitely. Amen. All right. Till next time. Hey, if you're still listening to this, you must really like us. So how about you go to iTunes or Stitcher and rate the podcast? Give us some feedback. You can also go to our website, unsupervisedthinkingpodcast.blogspot.com. You can comment on different episodes, or you could give us ideas for new topics you want to hear about. We would love to hear from you. Thanks.